Good afternoon, my fellow mushroom enthusiasts. <laughs> As a secretary of the Saget Fungus Association, I welcome you to the mycology department. Uh, it is a lecture series supporting uh, scientific research and facilitating uh, access to knowledge and revealing the full extent of mycology. Uh, I would like to say thank you to Dashta hosting this event in this, in this great uh, lecture room. Uh, please welcome Anne Pringle, mycologist, professor of uh, botany at the University of Wisconsin. Is it our last chance to know? It is. Please help us know. <laughs> So before I start, I want to—I would like to acknowledge the students in my team that have helped me to do the work that I'm going to talk about today. And from left to right um, is the death cap that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and um, Milton Draught, Mickey, who led the bio, a lot of the um, bioinformatics work on toxin genes that you're going to see. Jacob Golan, who did a lot of the original working up of the genomes. And Yen Wen Wang, Denny. Um, who did much of the work on unisexuality that I'm, that I'm going to talk about today. Also, for the last year, I've been living in South Africa on a Fulbright sabbatical, and a lot of my ability to write and think and actually get things done was enabled by this team of wonderful people, and so I also want to acknowledge them. And this is the team at FABI, which is the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute, on M Nelson Mandela Day, where we actually did 60, um, I think 68 minutes of public service ripping out invasive plants to represent Nelson Mandela's 68 years of public service to the world. So when you think about conservation biology or invasion biology, and those fields are closely linked, Usually you're going to think about a plant, and I, I don't know exactly what the plant would be in Hungary, maybe Ravinia, maybe something else. Um, or you're going to think about an animal that's invading. Or you might think about a disease that's killing a plant or an animal. Um, but probably you're not thinking about a mushroom. And I'm going to argue that mushrooms are also invading, moving across. And this is the title, Last Chance to Know. Because at the same time that we're in a golden age of mycology and learning so much because, in particular, of molecular techniques, so at the same time that we're learning so much, the world is also changing more rapidly than we can learn about it. And it's this tension that really drives the work that we do in my laboratory. And I'm going to talk about this different fungus, the golden oyster, at the end of the talk. So one of the privileges of being in southern Africa and, and traveling was I got to go to a lot of botanical gardens. And I'm showing you a picture now of the entrance to the botanical garden in Namibia, um, a country not too far from South Africa, and that's the Namibian flag. And when I was there, one of the things that made me laugh and that I loved is that the entrance to the botanical garden, back to the theme of invasion biology, they had these very charming posters, wanted, Lantana is the plant. They want Lantana armed because it's armed and displacing. They want it dead or alive. And, and, you know, this is a bad thing, right? This is an invasive plant in Namibia. It's not okay. And what should we do with the invasive plant? We should put it in jail. So outside the botanical garden, they had a box, and you could put the Lantana that you collected or anything else. So this is the sense we have of invasive plants, and it's for good reason. Invasive plants are often disrupting ecosystems. They're displacing native species. So, but I'm going to argue to you that, and I think it's no surprise to anyone in this room, that while we focus on, on plants and animals, the bulk of Earth's biodiversity is not a plant, not an animal, and not a pathogen. So I think as humans, we have a choice to make. What are we focusing on and why? And our choice has been to focus on the things that we can see for reasons that I understand. But there's a whole, and this is honestly just a, a phylogeny I randomly pulled off the web, um, but what, and it's only eukaryotes. And you can see that the, the metazoa and the fungi are here, so here's where we are. 
um, and the, I've forgotten where the plants are, but most of this, like the stromenopiles, the rhizarians, there might even be groups here that you've never heard of because most of us aren't trained in this huge biodiversity that's on planet Earth. There's some of these things like slime nets that I teach about. There's nobody that studies slime nets. Slime molds, at least in the United States, there's no one anymore, hardly, that studies slime molds. So all this like massive amount of biodiversity that just goes unnoticed and probably is being moved around. So while we know what to do with invasive plants, we put them in jail, we hardly know how to start thinking about the rest of Earth's biodiversity and what is happening to it. So I'm going to talk about mycorrhizal fungi first. And just as a quick introduction, this is a pine seedling. This is the root of a pine seedling. This is fungus. And so these fungus roots, mycorrhiza, are really the state of plants in nature. Right, so immediately an interesting question, right, for which I'm not going to talk about, but for an invasive plant, do invasive plants travel with mycorrhizal fungi also? Do they form new associations? Anyway, that's a different subject and a different talk, but there's no way to isolate a plant from its associations with fungi, and principal among those associations would be these mycorrhizal fungi. So back to South Africa for a minute, because I want to illustrate, I want to, I want to prove to you, I want to convince you that there are, that there's trouble. There's trouble in the world having to do with mycorrhizal fungi, not just plants and animals. This is a habitat in a high montane area of South Africa. Um, so unusual, you may not think, probably when you think of South Africa, you think of lions, and there are lions there. But there are also these beautiful grasslands. This is not either the, this is not the Fainbos, which is another famous habitat. This is different from both of those. But in the middle of these high montane grasslands, you see this. And this is maybe even familiar to people in Hungary because I see that you have it here too. It's plantation forestry. So these trees are mostly a Mexican species of pine, Pinus patula, and they're planted because people need paper towels, and especially in the pandemic, we, at least in the U.S., we thought about toilet paper a lot and paper goods of all sorts, cardboard. So, so trees are planted. They're a crop like corn. The crop is so valuable that it's barcoded. It's a very sophisticated, high-tech kind of industry, and eventually these things get turned into the plywood that we buy in the U.S. in a store called Home Depot. I don't know what the equivalent is in Hungary. But when you buy a piece of furniture from Ikea or Ikea, um, of course, the root of it is something that we're all participating in. This industry provides jobs for local communities. It's not a, it's not a trivial thing to engage in what this industry means. We all use products that come from this industry. So you can't, it's not a good or a bad thing. That's not the discussion. That's too naive. It's a, it has to be a more nuanced discussion than that. But the truth, so let me take a step back. So we're interested in plantation forestry. And before I tell you why, this is the Fabi team, 10 students from, from South Africa and 10 students from the United States. And we got together in part to look at plantation forestry and think about the impacts that it's having on landscapes. Here's Cecilia, who will be familiar to you now. She's here with me in Hungary collecting with Kira Lin, one of our South African students, another student of mine, Corbin Bryan, but with uh, Sikalela Buthasuela, who's um, another one of our South African students. So we had this exchange, and together what we were trying to do is actually study this fungus, which we've collected in the last week. It's Amanita muscaria. So this is a specimen from Kew Botanical Gardens in London, but it was collected in South Africa hundreds of years ago. And this is a fungus that is not native to South Africa. It was brought to South Africa to support the growth of pines, which are also not native to South Africa. So together, the plants and the fungi form a new association in South Africa that enables plantation forestry, enables the growth of the, the timber. And we know it's been there for a long time. And we know in South Africa that there are at least two kinds of muscaria, probably two, two different 
cryptic species, the yellow morph and the red morph, and this photograph was taken by, by Kira that I just showed a photo of. And we know that as of 1950, this fungus, which is not native to South Africa, was found around the Cape region. This is where the Dutch first settled, and they brought a lot of plants to grow. And so somehow when they brought the plants, they also brought this fungus. But what we did in the context of the workshop, all the students that I just showed you, is we, we, we traced what has happened to this fungus since 1950. Um, and I want to give a shout out to this woman who was the first woman in South Africa to receive a PhD. Her name is Ethel Doige. And these data come from her. Um, and so we then looked in resources like iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer and updated her data. And what I want you to notice is what was around the Cape is now very much spreading along the Garden Route and the Eastern Cape and even as far north um, as Hauteng province. And so this is what it used to look like around the Cape. This is what it looks like now. This is False Bay. This is False Bay again. In other words, it's quite common. And I'm not going to talk to you too much more about this, but since I'm now going to spend almost the rest of the time in California, one of the problems that I have when I'm talking with people is they wonder if the stories that I'm about to tell you from California are unique. Maybe it's rare to be an invasive mushroom. But by telling you this story from South Africa, what I want to say is it's not rare. It's just that there are very few people who are bearing witness to this change on Earth. And if you had to ask me what my mission is, I would say I bear witness to the changes that are happening on Earth in this bulk of Earth's biodiversity that we otherwise pay very little attention to. And I would welcome a lot more people to bear witness. So if you go, one last thought before we leave South Africa. If you go to the botanical gardens, very famous in Cape Town, Kirsten Bosch, they have these beautiful note cards. I love botanical illustrations. So I'm looking at these note cards and I'm buying them. And they all represent beautiful, endemic, native plants. The only mushroom that they will sell you is Amanita muscaria. And this is something I see all over the world. People don't know their local biodiversity. And so they adopt muscaria because it's beautiful, even though it's, 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 it's not the equivalent of these plants. It's from Europe. We could talk about that. Okay. So, Oh, sorry, two more thoughts. So meanwhile, in the same habitats where muscaria, where, sorry, not muscaria, in the same, in, meanwhile, in, in other habitats in South Africa, I would see things like this. This little yellow mushroom, I know that you don't use that coin, is about like the size of my thumb, smaller. And I think it's an undescribed species, beautiful. In the same habitats where this little yellow, tiny little yellow mushroom grows, is this species which is from Australia, and no one has written this down. Not no one, but it's hard to find. So again, just I want to leave you with a sense of change that's happening, maybe rapidly, but we don't study it, we don't know it. Um, and this was everywhere, it was in this everywhere. It was so, so common, Clapis archeri. All right, so why, why don't we know? Why are we so confused about fungal biodiversity? Now I'm taking you back to, or I'm taking you to North America, to the United States. And this is the earliest serious work of mycology related to the United States. And it's McIlvain and McAdams, 1902, 1001 American fungi. And what I want you to see is, um, see this number three? This will make really sense, to, this will make a lot of sense to you because you know the species. It, according to this book, this is Amanita phylloides. So I think all of you in this room can see that's clearly not Amanita phylloides. I mean, it's brown, it, you know, the ring is wrong, everything about it is wrong. This is because in 1902, an American looking at mushrooms only had books to look to, and they guessed. They were looking at a lot of fungi that were not described, a lot of mushrooms that were not described, 
and, and but they didn't know that they should maybe have different names, so they gave European names to everything they saw, and someone decided that this was a Phylloides, and that kind of stuck. Also, don't you love, here's the little elf reading his toxicology textbook in the middle of the, uh, you know, <laughs> it's kind of great. So, so there's things moving, there's confusion about what's local, there's confusion about names. This is a Danish mycologist who visited the United States around 1934, and he says, when an American mycologist who knows the European species from descriptions only faces the problem whether a particular fungus is the one named agaricus whatever by freeze, he will often be at his wit's end in other words, he has no idea, and may count on his buttons to settle the case. So I'm just going to finish that bit by saying that we still live with this legacy. So in Wisconsin, where I live now, I am often picking up mushrooms, and they have a European name. And I can look at the mushroom, and I can say, I know that you are not you know, the European name, but I don't know what you are. So there's still a lot of work to do to just name species. Um, and we live with this, you know, colonial legacy um, and struggle with it. I struggle with it. Okay, so we're, we're, things are moving. We're struggling with names. We don't know. Meanwhile, now we're in California, um, in these beautiful forests that are an endemic oak um, only found in this part of the world, Quercus agrifolia. So these beautiful forests in a national park. It's actually a national seashore, but it's like a national park. You, you throw, this is Mickey and Denny um, throwing themselves up the mountain, and you will see at the base then this fungus, which is, of course, the death cap, what we were collecting yesterday and the day before. And this is abundant everywhere. It's large. Um, and it's a mycorrhizal fungus, it's not a pathogen, and it's associating with the oak. So it's invading. And, and so for a long time, this is actually a photo I took yesterday <laughs> for, uh, here in Hungary. For a long time, yeah, <laughs> for a long time I've been documenting pattern in, in my career. Just everything I've just told you, just pattern, pattern, pattern. This is changing, this is changing, this is changing. And lately in the last year or so at Fabi, I, I really started to go to a different place, which is to ask why. Okay, so enough pattern. Why? What mechanisms? What is enabling the death cap to spread and be so successful in California? And because there's so few pe people who are bearing witness to this dynamic, it's, it's really difficult to know how to start. Like, what, where do you start? And so I've been turning to the older literature to start. And in particular, the work that has been done by a, a botanist um, who was named Herb Baker, he worked at the University of California at Berkeley, he's not really using the language of invasive species yet, but he's thinking about colonizing species is what he calls them. By the way, all of this language is not okay, right? Invasion battles, enemies. In invasion biology, we're stuck with a language that was developed after World War II, in particular by a, a soldier who came home from the war, Charles Elton, and wrote a book about it. So we have this language that we're stuck with, um, but it's a kind of a troubling, problematic language. Anyway, Baker didn't use that. He, he talked about what makes an ideal weed. So he used this word weed, and, and he came up with a table um, that is the characteristics of an ideal weed. And so for me, intellectually thinking about the problem, this is where I have started thinking about it. What, what makes the death cap an ideal weed? We don't use that word for fungi, but, I, I, this, but this is basically what I'm thinking about. What makes an ideal weed? And it's really interesting, this list, because a lot of it translates. So something that's an ideal weed should be self-compatible. In other words, it should be able to make seeds either by itself, um, but it should not be completely self-compatible. It should make a lot of spores, um, and it should have the ability to compete, perhaps, with allelochemicals, allelopathy. 
Um, and then a lot of other things as well. And so this is basically has been a guide for me for, for the work that we've been doing in the lab is thinking about all these things. And our tool has been genomes. And of course, DNA sequence data have revolutionized our ability to do ecology. Because with the genomes, we can pick up a lot of clues about what is happening in nature in a way that we couldn't before because humans use our eyes to see, but fungi are mostly hidden in soil or bark or substrates. So, so we have to use these other tools like genomes. And so we had about 86 genomes from Europe, um, which is the native range, as I know that all of you know. And then um, we had a number of genomes from California. And it's a very unbalanced design because we mostly have lots of genomes from one population in California and then a few things from a few countries here, which is part of the reason why Cecilia and I are in Hungary right now. We seek to balance our design a little bit and see, see what we can learn more about the European death cap from genomes. Um, and so we're testing these ideas. And I'm not going to talk about the toxin work too much, but um, but because I think this audience is a little familiar with the idea that death caps are deadly poisonous because they have toxins inside them, alpha aminidin, phylloidin. What you might have thought a few years ago is that you could sequence one genome and understand what toxins the species has. And this is what's been done for a long, well, not a long time, but for some years now. You sequence one genome. So instead, we have 86 genomes. And so we have blown apart this aspect of the story because there are some things. So this is alpha aminidin right here. So let me orient you. Each one of these is a mushroom is the way to think about it. So, so this is all, and blank means no, a color means yes. So you can see that this individual has this one, yes, 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 two kinds, nope, yes. So that's how you orient. And you can see that all of the individuals have alpha aminidin. Yes, 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 every, every mushroom. Every mushroom has this particular toxin gene. We have almost no idea what the ecology of the toxin is. What is the toxin doing? Who is the enemy? We don't know, which is amazing to me that we don't know. But we don't know. But at least they all have it. But then there are other ones where only some, some individuals, these yellow are European death caps. So European death caps have this toxin, and the California ones do not. Um, and anyway, you see patterns. But in this case, I'm arguing that this pattern gives us a clue to mechanism of invasion because there's very clearly a dynamic evolution associated with these toxins, these poisons, and that's a clue that something is happening in the e ecological interactions and another clue that this may be something about invading. And so we can divide up, I already talked about that, um, different individuals are different, and we can divide up the, the genomes into those, the toxins into those toxins that are found in all individuals. So the core genome, borrowing the language that people who study bacteria use, there's a core genome, and then there's an accessory genome. And it's probably, well, it's all interesting. But I don't, I'm really curious also about the accessory genomes. So in other words, in the same way that um, that Zhao is different from Cecilia, is different from Anne, is different from Attila. Um, every mushroom is, uh, every individual, genetic individual, mushrooms are different from each other too, right? They're, we don't look the same and neither do these individuals look the same. So it gives you a sense of the variation among the mushrooms. And again, I think this is, this is a huge part of why we're here. We're trying to understand now that we have this idea of a, of a mechanism, what it really means, so push it one step further. What's really happening? What's, what are these toxins doing? And, and if you would like to read more, this was recently published in, in ISME. All right, so um, we've talked a little bit about this ideal weed, allelochemicals. Um, now I want to talk about 
this idea of self-compatibility. So uh, maybe everybody knows this, but just in case, here is a traditional mushroom life cycle. You have two basidiospores. We'll just call them, they're different from each other. We'll just say black and white. They each germinate into a mycelium, and then um, they fuse. And so this is a dicaryon, two nuclei per cell. It's the dicaryon that develops the mushrooms. Um, inside the mushroom, the nuclei fuse, so there's a very brief moment of true diploidy, and then the basidium makes basidiospores. So this is the traditional life cycle, of a, of, of, and it should be what we find in the death cap. But instead, what we found is that two individuals, each made up of many mushrooms, don't look like that. Instead, they seem to have one well, we don't exactly know if it's one nucleus, but one kind of nucleus, not two kinds, not black and white, just one kind of nucleus. They, this is heterozygosity or genetic diversity, and they really stick out as being very unusual, and they are very unusual. And thus far, we've only discovered them in California. We've tested about 200 individuals in various ways from Europe. We haven't discovered it, but of course, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But at least so far, we only see them in California. And they are old. And the, I mean, this, so this, one of the individuals that we creatively called G21, <laughs> we find this individual from 2014 to 2021 because I go to the same field sites year after year. So I, so we have these kinds of data. Um, and the other one, we think has been around from at least 2004 to 2021. I'm not going to go too much into the details of this discovery, but it was just published in Nature Communications two days ago, three days ago, something like that. So you can, so it's fresh and you can find it if you, if you want to read about it. And Denny is the lead author. Um, so, so we have the genomes, and we, we wanted to ask, what's going on? Like, how does this work? Is it genetic? Um, what's the control? And again, I'm not going to go um, too much into the details here, um, but what we found out is that that death cap mating is controlled by, by one locus, not two loci, and that seems to be true for the entire genus Amanita, at least the genomes we have, five or six. So, so this is a clue. So there's only one locus that controls sex and, and sporulation. And um, Denny did this thing, which I thought I think is so creative. He went back to the assemblies. And I know some of you are bioinformaticians, and but for those of you who are not, let me explain. So this, so we're we should be working with a geno with genomes where where the genome comes from from the two different nuclei in the individual, right? We sequence the mushroom. So since we're sequencing the mushroom, we sequence the white nucleus and the black nucleus. So in order to, to understand the data better, um, we have to collapse the white nucleus and the black nucleus, the genome of the two together. And when it, there is a step in that process where you get what's called an assembly bubble. And the way to think about this, if, if this were a human, right, as humans, I, as a human, I have, one, I have one genome from my biological mother, one genome from my biological father. Let's say that for eye color, let's say my mother had blue eyes and my father had brown eyes. So if you looked at my genome, there would be an assembly bubble with the brown eye here and the blue eye here. And so you would need to make a choice about which, which variant are you going to show my mom's allele or my dad's allele. It's not exactly a perfect analogy, but for teaching, it's not too far off. But this also means that Denny could go back to these assembly bubbles of the one locus that controls sex and sporulation, and he could say, ah, this comes from the white nucleus, and this comes from the black nucleus. And so he could go back into the assembly bubble and retrieve the information, which he did. 
And the key point is that while there are assembly bubbles in all the, the mushrooms that appear to have the canonical life cycle, in the two individuals that are, that only appear to have one nucleus, there's no assembly bubble. There's no variation at all in the genome, which I hinted to earlier, and we can find the mating type locus. So, what's going on here? Do they make normal mushrooms? Yes. Two of these are heterokaryotic, two of these are homokaryotic. You, you can't pick them out. You know, we didn't in the field, right? We ran, this is a random discovery. We did not set out to discover unisexuality. There's nothing unusual. What about the spore numbers? Well, I showed you in the life cycle, and I'm going to remind you that each basidium should have four spores. I teach this every single year in mycology. I make all my students learn this life cycle, and we all draw four spores. And I think you know where this is going. Um, so sometimes we find that. Can you see there's a basidium here, and there are these four spores? Very pretty. Um, and, and, you can, and we stain the nuclei, and so you can see each spore has one nucleus here, although that is also about to get more complicated. But sometimes this, sometimes we don't see this. And this is like, when we first saw this, it was the weirdest thing I've, I think I've ever seen in my life. I felt like someone was showing me something I should not see. <laughs> it's very strange. But can you see there's only one spore here? So this is um, from one of the homocaryons, or unisexual individuals. But we don't just find one spore. Sometimes we find three. And what was already known about the, the genus Amanita, and is true for death caps as well, is that actually there are two nuclei um, per basidiospore. So here, we not only sometimes find one spore, but sometimes we find three spores. And in each of these three spores, there's two nuclei. And you can see that one nucleus got left behind. So what happens is when there's, only, when there's one spore, three nuclei get left behind. When there's two, two nuclei get left behind. And in any case, in, there's a mitotic division that follows meiosis, and, and that's what this is all about. Um, and I'm just going to do this because it's so fun. We, could, we can twirl it for you so that you can really see the three-dimensional aspect there. So we did this, um, and... Yeah, and that's that's uh, that's the that's the story. But um, this the, these these this individual is um, and this individual are actually the homokaryotic unisexual individuals. These three are are are, are the ones that are follow the canonical life cycle, and you can see that even though there's a difference in the proportion of four spored basidia or one spored basidia. In fact, it turns out that all, all individuals have the capacity to make these, make one or two or three or four spores. So what that is all about, I, if I, if I had, if I were gonna hypothesize, I would hypothesize that there's an innate tendency in the death cap to make different numbers of spores per basidium, and that somehow this can enable the origin of, of unisexuality or, or homo, uh, of homocaryons. That would be my guess. But, um, oh, and the other thing that I'm, I'm not going to talk about the data for, emphasis that it's published if you'd like to read the paper and free, it's open access, um, is that we also have evidence that the individuals that are mating with themselves, also their nuclei outcross. So the picture I want to leave you with is of nuclei that behave somewhat independently. They can live by themselves or they can mate. And the evolutionary biology of that is amazing to think about and, and, and fascinating. But you have, in, you, so you have multiple levels of individuality in this California population where the death cap is spreading, where nuclei can behave independently, bodies can behave independently. I know that that's a lot. 
um, but that seems to be the reality. And of course, the reason that we're ultimately, well, we're interested in it for lots of reasons, but for sure one reason is that these are invasive. And they do seem to have, just as Baker predicted for plants, an unusual, they are self-compatible, but not completely so. So maybe this is another clue, like a dynamic evolution of toxin genes, as to how they're invading. Again, back to the idea of moving beyond pattern to understand the mechanism. Why are they invading? Maybe this is a key to invading. Okay, so there are other things that we're interested in that I'm not going to talk about, but I want to talk about this idea of um, invasion biology again um, and what we don't know using a totally different system. So this, you guys might know what this is. Some people in this room work with Pleurotus. So this is um, the golden oyster, and it is something that people grow to eat, and we could talk about that, but we'll just leave it, that, leave it at that. So now we're no longer in California, but we're in Wisconsin, which is where I live. So as a biologist, I spend a lot of time in California. It's where my research is, but I live in Wisconsin. Meanwhile, what's happening in Wisconsin is that people start reaching out to me, and they say, Have you, do you know this golden oyster? Have you seen it before? And I hadn't really. And so people would, oh, I'm going to move the little hand. People would send me these, these photographs. You know, have you seen the golden oyster? What's it all about? And they're sending me photographs not from their backyard, not from a grow kit. They're, they're walking in the woods. And they're seeing it there. And there's a lot of it. And, and yeah, here's another photograph of it that someone else sent me. Have you seen the golden oyster? Okay, yeah, by now I, I've seen the golden oyster. I've been looking for the golden oyster, too. Another one. Have you seen the golden oyster? I found the golden oyster here. What's going on? What's happening with the golden oyster? Then I started taking my own photographs of the golden oyster. Okay, I see the golden oyster. It's everywhere. I don't know this woman. She sends me this picture. Dr. Pringle, have you seen the golden oyster? What is happening with the golden oyster? I was like, okay, I got the message. <laughs> I, in addition to California, there's something, there's trouble happening in my own backyard. Something is happening. What is happening? This is not supposed to happen. Why is the golden oyster that's being cultivated growing throughout Wisconsin and the Midwest? Um, so we're still in the middle of this story. Very, very much unfinished, unpublished data. But this is what we know. So it's the golden oyster mushroom, Pleurotus citrino pileatus. We call it GOM because it sounds ugly, and it's ugly. Um, it's an edible, invasive, it's a wood decay fungus. So it's not a fungus that associates with tree roots in a myco mycorrhizal association, right? It's not a pathogen. It's a decomposer, but it's not a mycorrhizal fungus. It was introduced to the U.S. with commercial grow kits. It has aggressive, it was bred, it was selected to eat wood and make sporocarps. That's the point of a golden oyster, right? You want the mushrooms. So it's aggressive, it grows aggressively, it has massive numbers of sporocarps, it's rapidly spreading, especially in association with elm. And I also want to acknowledge at this point Dr. Michelle Hussino, who's a scientist at the Forest Service, who is leading the work with the golden oysters. So we co-advise a student, Aishwarya Virabahu. Here she is in the woods. Someone asked me yesterday, Jayu asked me, invasive, what does it do? What damage does it do? And the honest truth is that for death caps, I, 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 it's not neutral. It's too abundant. There are things happening but I can't document it easily because it's a mycorrhizal fungus and I cannot culture it. But GOM is a different story. And so finally, we have a chance to understand the impact that an invasive fungus might be having. And we can talk about these words if you want, invasive, what it means. I don't necessarily think you need to prove impact to use the word invasive. But, but if we want to talk about impacts, this becomes a much better system or model for talking about impacts. So Michelle and Aishwarya went to trees without GOM, 
and trees with gom and drilled and got the wood and then used DNA sequence data to try to understand what's going on in, in trees where there is gom. And the data are dramatic. So here is a tree that has gom. It has, on average, something like two other, two fungi in it. Whereas something without gom has more like 18. And, and, and the variance is also quite different in these two systems. So in other words, the diversity is crashing in those trees where there's gom. Why? Maybe because the, well, I don't know why. Maybe I just won't even speculate. But there's a, there's a massive difference in the diversity and um, the kinds of species that you find when there's gom are quite different from the kinds of species that you find when there's no gom. So there is nothing neutral about gom. We, so right now what we have is data, and it, these are very fresh, like, you know, the first analysis was done just a few weeks ago, honestly. Um, so, so we have data that suggests that gom is, is reducing fungal diversity somehow by outcompeting the native fungal community, and that is very likely having an effect on carbon cycles and local ecosystems. It's, I hope the photographs that I showed you give you some idea of how common and abundant it is. It's really, really, really common. Just astonishing to walk through, walk through. The other thing that we worry about, of course, is that these trees that are infected by gom that are being eaten very quickly, usually a standing piece of dead wood should be a habitat for a long time. For example, for a woodpecker, right? that uses the tree as a nesting cavity or other birds or other creatures. These trees we think are falling down much more quickly. They're, they're being decomposed much more quickly. And so it not only has, the suggestion is it not only has impacts on other fungi, but it may have impacts on wildlife or e yeah, even on, on carbon cycles. And if you want to read more about it, this, um, the, uh, uh, this reporter, Natalie Jesjanka, who r wrote an article for Modern Farmer, which is not necessarily a, a, a magazine that I'd never heard of it before, but it's one of the best articles I've ever been involved with in terms of the media. And she has this, this really very thoughtful piece. Um, we didn't do the work, but um, a woman named Andy Bruce actually got strains from commercial growers and it's and so the link to commercial growing is quite clear. So I would just say, you know, back to the beginning of my talk, we don't think of fungi as invasive. We don't use the phrase invasive mushroom. We feel we have permission to grow anything that we would like in our backyards, whether it's from Asia or somewhere else. But I think that this story and the story of death caps, I hope, suggests that in addition to guarding our plant and animal biodiversity and conserving it, we might also be thinking about our fungal biodiversity and conservation and, and what that means. And by the way, there are a lot of things you can grow that we know are not invasive. So for example, in around me in Wisconsin, there's no suggestion that shiitake has ever escaped. So. In the same way that forestry is not, it's not a conversation about good and evil, right? There's nuance. If we, if you use toilet paper, then maybe some forestry is okay. This is also not a black and white conversation. It has to have some thought. We have to be better than that. Um, so we have to say, maybe we should not grow golden oysters anymore. I'm in favor of not growing golden oysters anymore at least in North America, right? Seems clear. But there may be other things we can grow. Or why not develop our own local strains in Wisconsin of Pleurotus? We have local Pleurotus. We have local oyster mushrooms. Why can't we grow them instead? If you are, probably there are some people listening who would never plant an invasive plant in their garden, and they eat local. I mean, that same thinking can also apply to mushrooms. I don't, yeah, I don't know why not. 
Anyway, so with that, I just want to thank the team. I don't have a photograph where all of us are together, so here are two photographs of the lab on a recent foray and the lab at actually Denny's graduation party, but he got cut off there. There's Denny's right there. That's silly. I just put the slides together. Anyway, um, thank the lab and then also thank funding sources. I also really want to thank Holly Elmore, who was um, a student of mine quite a while ago, because it was Holly who pointed out to me the literature by Herb Baker. And she was the one who first said, hey, maybe we should read this. Maybe this would be a good way to think about that. So I especially want to acknowledge her and a lot of other people who've helped along the way, and in particular the Fulbright for giving me this really wonderful year last year um, that I could spend thinking about these issues and, and uh, trying to write about them. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. I hope I didn't go too quickly. Thank you.